and then we'll go ahead and move into his presentation. So Ryan Peroy, he is an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Science at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. He is also the director of the Spatial Data An Analysis and Visualization SDAV Research Lab. He completed his graduate studies in geography at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and he has an undergraduate degree in physics from the College of William and Mary in Virginia. <laughs> Just like Isaac Asimov, he grows more handsome with each passing year. Mahalo, Ryan, for joining us. Right, thank you very much, Hoku, and everybody. <laughs> Um, it's a it's a pleasure to be here and to uh, uh, chat with you all and share some of the, the work we've been uh, doing, uh, looking at um, Ohia mortality over time using high resolution imagery. So hopefully you guys can all see see my you know the, the slides I posted um, there. Okay, and Looks can good. hear me. All right, excellent, and Looks hear good. me. Okay. Um, so. I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have a filter on. I, I, maybe after I talk, I can put a filter on, but, but um, I didn't want to distract too much. Okay, um, so certainly lots of folks, you know, we are a collaborative outfit um, here and all kinds of folks we work with, including, you know, many of the folks on this, on this call. I imagine. So um, just wanted to certainly acknowledge that and the folks who are also helping to fund this, this, this work. Um, so I'm talking to you guys here from beautiful, it's not raining right now, uh, Hilo, um, on the campus of the University of Hawaii at Hilo. We've got a, a little bit of a break in the weather here. Um, it's a wonderful place. If you're looking for, uh, you know, graduate or, or undergraduate education, I'm also the, I'm currently the chair of the Department of Geography and um, Environmental Science. Um, most of the time we're trying to get our students out doing field work. COVID's been a bit challenging for that, but hopefully next fall we'll be back in kind of full, full swing. And again, um, uh, part of the Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Science Program. I also run the STAV lab, the Spatial Data Analysis and Visualization Lab. And so we uh, try to apply geospatial tools to problems of, of local significance and then to share that information out more broadly. We do a lot of different things, you know, lava, uh, shoreline erosion, um, a number of graduate students and, and folks in the lab, including uh, Timo and Esther, who are, are, are definitely co-authors on, on this, um, and do work out in the larger Pacific as well. This is from Marshall Islands. We do some surveying out there. But today I'm, I'm talking to you guys a bit about the work that we're doing, um, trying to monitor and better understand rapid Ohia death. Um, and I, I, I don't have a, a lot of background on uh, the fungal pathogens itself. I assume that this, this group, you guys are, are somewhat familiar with this. And so um, rod is just a descriptor, rapid ohia death. Um, what's actually happening is trees are being infected with uh, 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 different fungal pathogens. The primary one that we're worried about is, is, is uh, uko, uko ohia. Um, and, uh, and so we can, we can see an infection or we can find suspected trees by looking at high resolution imagery. So this is an example that from one of our images uh, collected with a, with a drone or a unoccupied aerial system. That's the new thing you should say, because before you, we were supposed to say unmanned, but that's not gender, right? So now we say unoccupied aerial vehicle. So, um, which is a better, better term. But we found that, as we, as we look at trees over time, um, trees which are infected go through a, a, a sequence of stages that are visible in the imagery that we collect. Um, and so they start to get kind of chlorotic or yellow uh, first. That's a, a pretty brief stage. It may just last you know, a, a week or two. And then they can turn this bright reddish brown. And after that, the, the color fades out to a sort of a faded brown. And then the leaves kind of lose their color altogether, become bleached, and then the, the, the leaves fall off. Um, and so as you're uh, looking at, at this image, you can see uh, trees at each of those different stages here. So this sort of yellow, yellow guy, and then kind of the bright red guy, and then this post-peak um, brown. There are a lot of examples of that, and then this fine, fine white. And so this is helpful for us um, to because it, it is this progression. And so if we see this progression um, within the, the time period that is, is normal for these, these, these stage changes, 
that allows us to uh, get a good handle on whether the tree has come out. And so if we look at, at one individual tree over time, we can see these changes. So this is the same tree over time. And you can see it goes through these different sort of uh, canopy coloration changes. And eventually it gets kind of faded out and then it gets into this kind of fine white. And then eventually all the, all the leaves will fall off and it'll be a, be a skeleton. Um, and we can not only see this with our eyes, we can also quantify this using things called um, vegetation indices. And so this is just an example of us applying a, a remote sensing vegetation index to this image and being able to kind of parse out these different um, stages. And I should say that these, these it's, it, it's sort of artificial that I'm saying, oh, it's stage one, it's stage two. The truth is the tree goes through a continuum change, right? Once it's, once it's expressing. Um, and so, but we've, we've decided for grouping purposes to break it up into these different, different stages. And so we look at images and we collect images over time. Um, and so I'm just gonna show you a sequence of images from here on the big island. And part of my job is to keep my analysts from becoming depressed um, because we look at a lot of uh, images of, of, of trees you know, declining. Um, and, and, and so we've got to keep reminding ourselves, you know, we're, we're trying to study this and, and better understand it. And so we use a lot of different um, imagery platforms uh, to, to collect imagery and, and understand things. And so ranging from you know, assortment of, of drones, we've got like a fleet of drones in my lab, uh, to imagery acquired from fixed wing airplanes, uh, to a helicopter system we're developing, I'll talk about a little bit. And now um, with some high resolution satellite imagery, which has a, a great benefit of, of more extended coverage than what we can get with drones or helicopters. And so we've been using this uh, assortment of um, imaging platforms to monitor uh, sites around uh, Big Island. So um, all around, uh, mostly on the east side of Big Island, um, including a couple of uh, 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 spots with, with collaborators in the National Park Unit, not so much on um, Kona side, just for, for logistics. Um, but we're also now working with um, you know, great folks over on Kauai um, who are doing repeat imaging uh, monitoring with drones uh, for a couple sites. And they're sharing those data with my lab. And so we can analyze those and and make maps of 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 where the where the trees are are uh, becoming potentially infected. And again, we were doing this to try to understand how things are changing over time, and um, what our our future might might look like. Um, and so we can look at these data various ways. Thank you. Um, okay. Take care. All right. Bye bye. And. Uh, and we can, again, compare these changes over, over time. And so this is from one of our sites, and this is just another way to visualize it, um, but you can see um, places where we've got, um, you know, when we started out imaging, uh, most of the forest was looking really nice and healthy. Um, and then over time, uh, we see more and more uh, decline occurring. And again, we're able to, to map this out and, and better understand these, these uh, trajectories over different locations. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a graph and it's showing on a, on a per acre basis, um, uh, changes in, in cumulative mortality, right? So you start out with low numbers and then if there's another tree appears then you just add to that count. So you're, we're just basically adding to the count of dead and dying trees over time. And um, for this is a, a number of our different uh, monitoring sites on Big Island I'm, I'm showing right here. And uh, different locations have different densities of cohia trees, right? Some may be more scattered and some might be more, more dense, um, but the, the shape of the curve uh, or these curves is, is, is quite interesting. And what we seem to see in, in, in a repeated um, um, sites, is an initial um, burst of uh, lots of mortality in a, a short period of time. And then after that, uh, we, we see uh, continued mortality. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop necessarily after this initial sort of, um, of uh, outbreak, um, but we see uh, sort of uh, continued, continued mortality. And um, in some of the sites, we're um, able to make projections and, and 
um, and think about you know when all the trees might uh, might might be gone um, if 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 current trends continued and it varies from site to site um, but in some of the the you know these two tree these two sites here this ranch in Kau um, and and Stainback actually. Um, these two sites in you know, 20, 25 years, if things uh, uh, keep on as they are, uh, we might lose all the ohia trees in those, in those sites. Trees that, that we can see from the air, right? And so there might be um, cases where you have regeneration occurring and we can't see that from the, from the drones or the helicopters. But if they're in a site with there's a lot of grazing or there's a lot of non-native trees that are around to choke things out, it makes it really hard for uh, the native trees to, to re-establish. Re and so the story at lowland invaded places or where there's a lot of grazers is different than in, in upland forests where regeneration um, may be much more likely. Um, but these are helpful curves in, in coordination with you know, other data sets. Flint Hughes is doing all kinds of work uh, with a lot of ground plots. And, um, and in some places we're seeing you know, very similar things um, from what we get from the drone imagery and the helicopter imagery and what he's seen from his, his ground-based plots. Um, so I wanted to share a couple of examples from some of the different sites, uh, just to give you a sense about the kinds of things that we're seeing. And also um, some of the spatial patterns that we can pick up that are related to, to management and in particular um, related to fencing. Because I think this might be an important part of this. And again, you know, other folks have made these kinds of observations, but I think our data are helpful for, for seeing this on kind of a fine scale. So in the Lapoy Forest Reserve, um, this is a site that um, uh, there was a tree uh, found uh, back in November of 2016. It was tested and was positive for Alucohia. And this is, you know, some of our uh, most wonderful uh, Mohia forests uh, here on, on Big Island. So a really important place. And so we, we wanted to include that as a part of our monitoring effort. And so every, in this case, every six months or so, we would go and we'd do a flight and we would see very few uh, suspect trees. And so we were really psyched, like, oh, this is great. You know, for whatever reason in this, in this forest and when other of our sites were really going off and all kinds of mortality, Lapoy Forest Reserve was holding, holding steady with just, you know, very low numbers of suspect trees. In late 2019 and then in early um, 2020, that story started to change where we started to see a lot more um, suspect trees. And, and that was uh, quite uh, concerning. And it's also, this is a really dense forest with really tall trees. And for doing um, drone flights, it's quite challenging because there are, are rules we need to follow about keeping your eyes on the drone and some other things. And so we would work really, really hard and be able to image maybe a square kilometer and we would just come back. And, and I say we, I mostly mean Timo, um, uh, but on occasion, I'm also out there too, but mostly my, Timo is my main pilot. Um, but we get you know really great imagery and are able to identify, again, these suspect trees I should point out that, that from our imagery, we can identify trees we think may be infected, but to confirm that you need to always get a, at this point, a physical sample. So somebody needs to go to the tree and get a sample and then have it tested at the lab. Um, so we can, we can, again, identify trees we sus suspect have the fungal pathogen, but we need the laboratory analysis to confirm that. And so the area, we were like, ah, oh, this, this outbreak is bigger than what we can see with our, our drones um, reasonably. So we, we started to use this helicopter system that we're developing for imaging um, uh, with support from the National Park Service. Um, and then also with David Okita, the, the, the pilot, uh, who's given a lot of great insight. And then um, Russell at r and Welding here in Hilo. If you need any machining work done, Russell is your man. I can't say enough about this guy. He's amazing. Um, and so this system, uh, it's a custom system we've uh, uh, built. Um, it's aluminum and it's a, it's a jettisonable class B load. It's been approved for flights by the Department of Interior. Um, uh, so it's, uh, you know, it, it's our system. It's got uh, increasingly um, more fancy stuff on it. It's differential GPS and an IMU and some other things, but basically allows us to cover a lot more ground. That's, that's the main point of this. Um, than what we can do with the, the drone imagery. So this, this outline in pink, this is the area we could cover in about an hour with the helicopter. 
And then this area here in this sort of, you know, greenish color is what we did with multiple days of really hard work. With so it allows us to expand our, our, our imaging area by quite a bit, going from, you know, hundreds of acres to thousands or tens of thousands of acres. Actually, next week, uh, Tim is going to be over on Kauai if the weather holds, and we're probably mapping 30 plus thousand acres over there for some, some interest that they have. And so again, we get this imagery and we can look at the, the trees and the, the, the canopies and, and we've developed a system to basically rate the canopy in terms of how confident we are uh, that the tree may be infected with the fungal pathogens responsible for rapid odia death, particularly leuco odia. And so basically, you know, can we tell if it's ohia tree or not? What's the canopy condition? You know, what's the coverage of the canopy? And we have a numeric system, and then we basically have a high and a medium and a, and a low confidence rating for the for the tree. And so, um, uh, through uh, uh, you know a bunch of hard work of folks on the ground going out and doing uh, sampling of trees we identified as suspects, um, uh, a lot of trees were sampled. And um, this graph is 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 this little table here is is showing uh, for a subset of our our, our points we identified as suspects, what the lab results were. So for all the trees we said were high confidence guys, 100% of those guys came back with detections for leucodia. For the trees we said were medium confidence suspects, 91% of those guys came back positive after test results. And for the guys we said were low confidence, 17% um, um, of those guys came back. And so this, this confidence rating system um, at least for La Poya Forest Reserve, it seemed to be working pretty, pretty well. Um, and again, that's, that's helpful for us uh, as we move forward to better use uh, limited resources. We actually just did a, another helicopter mapping run last week over La Poya Forest Reserve to get a, a nice handle on how things are, are changing. So we're processing those images right, right now. This is an image from uh, Shifting Gears to another site, the uh, Kahuku um, unit. Uh, lower paddocks area for the national park system. And, you know, one of the stories here that comes out to my eyes, at least, is, you know, the, the impacts and influence of, of fencing, right? And so um, to the east of the, the park boundary, this sort of unfenced area, we see many, many, many suspect trees. Um, and then within the, 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 the park unit, the fenced area, a much, much lower numbers of, of suspect trees. There has been Leucohia confirmed within the Kuku unit um, of the National Park. And we sort of every six months or so, we, we do uh, repeat um, uh, flights over here in coordination with the National Park. Um, but, you know, this image, I think, is a, is a pretty strong um, uh, evidence uh, that, that uh, you know, fencing can be really helpful to minimize the wounding that occurs to trees because we know that wounding is one of the main ways that trees can become infected. And so if you keep trees from getting wounded, um, they're, they're, they're much less likely to, uh, to pick things up. This is another example from the Ola'a unit, um, again in Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Uh, this is from a flight we did a while ago, a helicopter flight. It was relatively small, but again, you can see this sort of strong fence line um, signal inside the fence unit, very few suspect trees, outside many, many suspect trees. Now this next image I'm gonna show you is from uh, later in time. And it was after um, the, the, the volcano eruption and, and, and there was just a whole lot going on. And so the, 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 the maintenance of the fences uh, wasn't able to be what they wanted it to be. And um, so I'm not, I'm not blaming anybody, I'm just giving you context for uh, this next image, which shows that um, inside the, the, um, this unit, which had been, um, I'll just go back, you know, again, we don't have imagery for the whole area, but what we did see inside this box here, right, inside this guy, this unit, very few cases, but then later on, we see all kinds of cases. And but up here, we see very, very few. And in here, we see very, very few. So these guys, the fences were still maintained or hadn't been breached basically. But unfortunately in, in this unit here, the fence lines had been breached and some cattle had gotten in here. And so I'm not able to say that that cattle did this, you know, but it, it is, it, it again, is sort of supporting evidence that having fences that are well-maintained and keeping ungulates out of areas 
um, like what we see here and here is really important um, for again, protecting our, our forests. This is, uh, this is some recent work um, also up in uh, Havo and the, called the first in unit, so around the lava tube. And I think this is, this is really important. Um, so we did see trees in this area um, that, that we thought had the characteristics of being you know, high confidence suspects, right? And so almost every red tree inside this teal area was sampled. But only one of those came back positive for Leucohea. And that's, and again, this, this, you know, in La Pohoihoi, we had 100%, right? So if, if we say it's confidence, then 100% of those guys came back. Uh, the same story actually in um, the Ola'a unit. If we said it's a, you know, high confidence suspect, every single one of those trees that got tested came back positive. But in Thurston, um, we said a number of these guys were high confidence, but only one came, it was like one out of 15 or something. And so for my batting average, it's terrible. I'm, I'm very happy for Thurston because I don't want Luke Ohi in this amazing place. But, um, you know, there's something else going on here. Uh, this is an example of one of the trees that we identified as a, as a high suspect, um, and it came back uh, non-detect. And so there's something going on in Thurston, uh, which is killing the trees and, um, and which is really interesting. And, and it's not killing all the trees, right? It's only killing Ohia every, every once in a while. But the, the crowns exhibit symptoms that look very similar. They fooled us, right? It looks very similar to what we see from um, a Luke Ohia. And so understanding, you know, what are these other causes for, for Ohia mortality, I think is really important, right? Um, for us to just know what's a normal background and how is what we're seeing with Rod different than what we've seen in the, in the past. And, um, just to kind of close out, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but we're also um, doing some work with uh, high resolution satellite imagery because we're getting access to this imagery now and we haven't had access to this imagery for um, in the past. And this is really exciting because just like the helicopter allows us to image a much larger area than the drones do, um, the satellites allow us to image even a much larger area than the helicopter. Um, but there's, a, there's a, a, a cost there and that cost is in spatial resolution. So the, 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 and basically it's like a, if you take a photo with a, your camera and you zoom way in, you see those little blocks, those pixels. And for our drone imagery, those pixels are about one to two centimeters. For the helicopters, uh, they're about four or five centimeters. And for the satellite imagery, it's about 30 to 40 um, centimeters. Above 50 centimeters per pixel, we have a really hard time identifying individual trees. Um, but, if we uh, zoom in on an area, just to give you a sense, I'm not sure how well this will come out across Zoom, but um, hopefully you can see some individual red trees in this scene. And so that's great because um, uh, we can use that information uh, to, uh, to basically look at, at change over time. So this image is, is from 2020. Uh, this is from November 2020. A lot of those red trees have now become faded brown, which is the sequence that we see over time. Um, and then we can classify this imagery. And so we can find red crowns and, 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 and faded crowns. Um, and then this is uh, a January of 2021. And then this is February of 2021. So there's a lot of the satellite imagery that's coming down that we can potentially use in a, a larger way to monitor our forests. And Brian Tucker and some folks from the um, uh, Forest Service, uh, David um, Greenberg, were, we were just talking in a meeting about this, this yesterday, um, about how to, how to do this. And so this is an example of a single satellite image. And you can just see like that one image covers a good portion of the, of, of the, the coastline. And so that's, that's great. We just got to get, keep getting access to this imagery and figure out how to, you know, most efficiently um, analyze it. Um, because this is a way to potentially, you know, minimize the amount of helicopter and other work that we're, we're doing. Um, you'll see up in the upper part of this image, there's a bunch of these white things, which are clouds. And so there's places where clouds are very persistent. And so there's always going to be places where you wish you had imagery, but just where you want to see what's happening there's a cloud. So I think the, the satellite imagery can be one part of our, our sort of our imaging arsenal, but it's not going to sort of solve all of our, our problems. Um, but anyway, I think that's pretty much uh, what, I, what I had to share. Um, so thank you guys very much. I, I've missed any 
comments or heckling or questions in the chat. So if there's things that I can address, I'd be happy to happy to do that. So that's the presentation I have uh, ready for you guys right here. Mahalo Nui, Ryan, that was awesome. I loved all that imagery. It was, it was, yeah, it was a really cool story just to see how things are changing over time. Um, if anybody feel free to put um, questions in the chat box, if you've got some questions for Ryan, that would be awesome. We've got some time. I do see. There's one from Jeff Bagshaw. Asking uh, right on, I, I, I see the chat now. Um, yep. Yep. So what's the difference between pictometry and satellite imagery? So, so pictometry is uh, imagery collected uh, generally by fixed aircraft and it's, um, and it's about 10 to 15 centimeter uh, resolution in terms of each pixel, where again, the satellite imagery is uh, that we're working with is you know, 30 to 50 centimeter resolution. And the other thing that's different is the satellite imagery is, is multi-spectral. So that means it includes bands which are beyond just you know, visible red, green, blue, like most of the, the images I was sharing from the drone and helicopter. Although we're got some other instruments that also can be multispectral, but the, that's important because um, these longer wavelengths, longer than what our eyes can see, um, do have uh, potential for doing things like early detection of, um, of symptoms. Um, and allowing us to um, basically take more advantage of this spectral information than we can if we just limit ourselves to the to the. Um, so the satellite imagery is different from pictometry in the the, the, the resolution of pixels. So it's more coarse, so 30 to 50 centimeters, um, and it's also got additional bands. So there's it's multi-spectral. Nice, thank you, thank you, Jeff, for your question. I um, had some questions to myself, so. When you're doing the surveys, how long does it take you to do the surveys? And if you, if you find um, suspect trees that aren't rot infected, what do you do? Do you go look further into the types of diseases, try and identify what's um, affecting the tree, or how do you? What happens there? Yeah. So, um, I, 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 so, so the the last question, you know, if if, if we identify a suspect tree and um, it gets tested, and then what happens if it comes back non-detect? So, so my group, we're not the plant pathologists, and so, um, you know, that's that's kind of, you know, uh, I don't want to just beg that question, but but I think that's an important thing to figure out, and I, I don't think we fully figured that out yet. JB or Flint um, uh, could potentially chime in. Um, you know, there's there's many cases where people have said, um, oh, I think this is a, 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 a suspect odd tree and it gets sampled and for whatever reason, it doesn't come back as a positive hit. And there's you know, there's different possibilities for that. One is that the sampling just, just missed, um, uh, that you just sampled in a place um, and maybe the infection was higher up in the crown or whatever the case is. I think that's, that's unlikely, but we do know that as time progresses, so if we image a tree and it's 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 a red tree, right? And it looks really hot, um, but that tree doesn't get sampled for a really long time. Um, the longer amount of time that passes, uh, we have we have less success. I'll, I'll put it like that. So as trees become you know more of the spine white and into the skeleton, they dry out. So they dry out, and so the lab has a much harder time recovering uh, a, a good sample. Um, so I, I think that's one element of it, but, but another part is that ohia trees do die for different reasons, right? And so I don't know that we have the, uh, the, the capability now to, to go to a dead ohia tree and, and definitively understand what it was that killed it. It didn't, it wasn't killed by the fungal path responsible for Rob. But again, looks like JB or others may come in. Oh yeah, no, I was just gonna say that we have, you know, looked at um, those trees, particularly in Thurston, because we noticed that back in 2016, a lot of trees that, to me at least, and to Flint, they looked like they might have rod. And, but when we cut them up, they didn't have the staining. And we haven't found another fungal pathogen that would be killing them. So there's, there's more things than we know out there, you know, so, and, and in a couple other cases, we have found other, other fungal pathogens that don't seem to be hugely widespread. Yeah. Um, so we've, some of those we've diagnosed, like Ryan says, most of them 
we just don't do the follow up on uh, on all the other things. But some of them we have diagnosed with some other fungal pathogens. Um, some trees have gotten killed by herbicides, um, and there's definitely something going on in volcano that we don't know what it is, and it's killing a lot of ohia trees. Yeah, and I, I think too. Sorry, just to just to chime in a little bit is, um, and certainly in, when we started trying to figure out rapid ohia death, we we didn't quite understand the the where we where we were looking for positive ceratocystis trees and finding them um, was kind of random for us. We were still learning, and and I, on the Big Island at least, I think we have a pretty good handle on generally um, who's dying from rapid ohia death and and who likely is what uh, and and what other trees are suffering from some other phenomena we've we've kind of not figured it out 100 percent, but it, it's our crews the scientists tend to feel pretty confident about okay this is very likely ceratocystis uh, thirst and notwithstanding i suppose but um but other places it's like oh no that's something else that's been going on there and we we understand that and that's not really rod um so that's just another bit of information for you all nice and i guys and i just have to say i i gosh it's great to see ryan but i missed that 70s haircut gosh <laughs> oh my gosh i'm a little yeah. disappointed I'm sorry. I talked to my son. He's the one that did this to me. Oh, I'm going to give him a talking to. <laughs> oh, thank you guys. That's awesome. So Flint, before we move into 